What's up, everybody? Welcome in to a very, very special episode of the Celtics Talk podcast here on the NBC Sports Boston Podcast Network. I'm honored anytime we get to have the legend Mike Gorman on the podcast, but uh, this is a celebration. A couple days from now, we'll all be jammed down in Mohegan Sun. We'll have some masks and all that, but we'll get to uh, watch Mike get the Kurt Gowdy Award, uh, the highest honor really for a, a journalist in our field. Uh, I know we talked about it when the when the announcement came out, but I want to start here. How are you feeling in the ramp up to this uh, to this Mike Gorman celebration? Well, I mean, and Mike Gorman and all. Uh, the, I, I know I'm, we're not here to focus on anybody else. This is the Mike Gorman I, focus of the fair. night. That's fair. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited. I'm very excited. They, they told me, Chris, they said, why don't you write up a little speech? You know, and I said, sure. And so I did. And the first draft came in about 28 minutes. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I gave it to them. They were horrified. They said, I said, what are you looking for? They said, two, two to three. <laughs> ah. I said, okay. So I think we got something that's going to go that's right around. I, every time I do it, I do it a little differently and start ad living and get in trouble. But uh, probably go about three or four minutes, four minutes maybe. Um, they gave me uh, Jay, Jay Billis's speech a couple of years ago. And mm-hmm. it's good. It's very good. It tells a great joke at the beginning of the speech if you want to ever tune in. It's really good. But the whole speech is maybe. I don't know, 90 seconds, two minutes, um, real quick. Thank you very much. Really a thrill. Bye-bye. Um, I'm going to be a little longer than that. How do you condense 40 years of awesomeness into four minutes? I don't know. Um, it's funny. I had, you know, and I really, I tell you, sometimes I think I could work a, write a season's worth of screenplays, uh, sitcoms for this, because uh, it's like uh, Ted get in there before I did. I think we could have done this. Um, but uh you can't condense it as the bottom line. So when, what I do, Chris, and without giving it away, what I do is I just tell you how at the, the very beginning, because I, I came to this point after I got out of the military and come back home where I could have gone either way. Uh, I was either going and try, try to pursue this business or just take a teaching job like I had an opportunity to do and just go off and, and do that. Um, and there's one, literally one scene that played in my life between myself and a uh, security guard that changed my whole life around. So... So, well, okay, well, I don't want to give away your whole speech, but I, I sort of know this this story. So you yeah. went in, and knocked on the door of Gil Santos's office, right? And and said like, hey, I, I, I'm looking for a job. So like, what what was that like? How did you shake down the security guard? Uh, oh, I can't tell you. I'll tell you, you gotta listen. I gave you a hook there, Pam, you gotta listen. But in terms of Gil, Gil was wonderful. I mean, I talked to Gil for maybe 15, 20 minutes. And he, he looked at me and he said, you know, I think I, I can do something for you. And he basically called this radio station that he used to work in in New Bedford and said, I got a guy here I think you'll like going down. Um, and I'll tell you this, this is too long to deal with down there. But I go down and I meet this guy about three o'clock in the afternoon. We have a couple of beers over lunch. He's a good guy, as you would expect Gil's guy to be. Um, and he says to me, uh, do you play softball? And I said, uh, yeah. Um, and uh, you know the story, and he did, and I did. They had this big game against their rival station in town that night, and I used to be a fairly decent softball player, so I think I hit three home runs and knocked in about eight runs in the first time in 10 years they'd beaten these guys. And as I'm standing at home play talking to my guy, Paul, who, and I still don't have a job, I've just been drinking and playing softball, and a guy from the other station comes across, and he says, he says, Paul, it's not we're going to have any ringers. And Paul said, well, there's no ringers on my team. And the guy goes, yeah, what about him? And Paul goes, well, that's my public affairs uh, guy. He's a public affairs job for the station. And I'm, like, I'm in the business. Here I am. I got a job. And I did. And I was spent about a year there. It was fun. Do you ever wonder what would have happened if you like went over three and like they forced you to sacrifice or, or something on, the, on that I, night? Yeah. And I, I was right there, Chris, because it had been funny. I had, I got out of school and, and, and immediately went enlisted in the Navy and went to OCS and then went to flight school, which put me about 18 months into the, the Navy. And they sent me a squadron in Brunswick, Maine for three and a half to four years. And that's where I flew out of. And I finally decided, that's it. I'm not going to, I don't want it to be up. So I came home. But when I came home, all the guys, like uh, nobody went out on Friday nights anymore because everybody had kids. Everybody was married. They're into parenting. So all the guys that I had hung out with and ran with before I went away, when I came back five or six years later, they were all married or married and divorced or wrecked or whatever, you know? Um, and so life was very different. So I had no idea which, which way I wanted to go, what I wanted to do. And um, I started interviewing all these crazy companies. You know, somebody gets you, I get you an interview with Beckton and Dickinson. I'm like, oh, good. I don't know what they are or what they do or why. <laughs> so that, that never really worked out very well. Um, but yeah, I was saved by a security guard on Soldier's Field Road. Man. Uh, so, all right. So lead me through those early days. Cause you had to sell your own advertisements. I heard you say like, you might 
uh, be willing to throw in a little good word about a, 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 anyone who bought an advertisement's kid during the high school football game. You know, what, what was those early days like for Mike Gorman? Wild West. I mean, really, um, what, small time radio, and if you've ever done it, but small time radio is really the wild, wild west. I mean, you can do pretty much anything if you can sell it, because that's the bottom line all the time is to try to get stuff on the air that's sponsored, as opposed to putting stuff on the air that just kind of floats out there. So um, I started selling stuff, and I had a guy named Frank Daly, who I worked with a lot, and um, we became kind of a team at WNBH New Bedford. We did boxing, we did football, we did basketball, you name it, we did. If you could sell it, we'd do it. He sold it. We sold it to Bedford Country Club um, Club Championship. And we had uh, Frank stood out there with a, t- with a telephone and called me in and told me what guys were doing. I'd make up play-by-plays. Um, very funny, good stuff. Fights up in, New- in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts that the New Bedford Standard Times would not sell, send a guy to. They would instead get to listen to us on the radio and then write their stuff in the sports page off the radio. And we would be making the whole fight up. Meanwhile, uh, it would be very, it was very funny to read what came out the next day. But again, stuff like that happened all the time. Nobody got too upset about it. Um, that's just the way it was. And I say small time radio because of dollars. The people there were wonderful that I worked with down in the Bedford. Uh, it was a great experience to hang out with those people and, and do it. Um, but we were really making it up as we went along. <laughs> what where did you learn your play-by-play voice how did you hone those skills was it just from listening a, as a child I really think so i have a play-by-play voice that's good no i'm just saying like like but like everyone has to sort of develop that right it's not like you just wake up like if you said tomorrow hey hey chris i'm not feeling well i need you to call this game i'd be like uh like you you gotta you, it takes time to craft that voice right uh, it, it yeah it does i mean again it does it, it, it takes time to craft more style than a voice i mean uh, if you're talking about accent my accent was just unbelievable well, i mean one tape of, a, of something i did down at wmbh hidden somewhere away and it, i put it on once every five years i'll drag it out and, and listen to it and I, who is this guy <laughs> uh, my accent was just terrible um but you do you develop and, and um i tell you it's funny and it, it, it sounds crazy but um People, if you were to ask people what's Mike Gorman's style, I think they would say, well, he really doesn't say a whole lot. He kind of lets the game play by itself. And my dad said to me when I got the job in New Bedford, I said, have any advice? And he said, yeah, never pass up the opportunity to say nothing. Um, and I'm thinking, that's a great piece of advice if you don't want to be on the radio. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Is it, I mean, that's, I don't want to be sitting there going, passing up every question that goes by because dad says it's a good idea. But, um, but I think what he was trying to tell me was less is better. And I've always believed less is better. Um, the guys I would, I'd steal from Ray Scott. I would steal from Pat Summerall. Um, I would steal for those guys who were uh, Joe Tate out in Cleveland who you could get late at night. Uh, um, and uh, those guys didn't, Joe talked a lot because he did radio. The other guys were, were football and football announcers primarily have a lot of stuff in between where it's just dead air. If the color guy fills it in fine, but if the play by play guy doesn't. And, uh, you know, uh, I mean, Pat Summerall would be like, you know, Forsberg, back to throw. No. To say no, nope, you know, <laughs> that was it. They go over to the guys and catch it. Um, Ray Scott was another one who just really did, had a minimum amount of words. So uh, I guess if I stole stuff from them, I stole the silence that they used as an advantage. Uh, Has anyone along the way ever said you need to talk more? Because, like, isn't that? Oh, yeah. The, it, it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, all the time. I mean, I, you know, it took me a while to get jobs and, um, a fellow named Mark Haynes, who was brilliant, who worked, uh, um, ultimately was the first guy that Roger Ailes hired when he tried to start, or did start CNBC. Um, Mark came, was working in Philly at the time after leaving Providence, where he discovered me on the way back from uh, the Cape driving through New Bedford, fooling around with his radio dial on a weekend. He found me, uh, called on Monday and gave me a job. So um, again, it was, it was stuff like that, breaks like that, right place, right time, as Dr. John sang one time. Um, that's really what you want to do is, is uh, get lucky. And I was, I, I, and that's not false modesty. I'm not trying to be anything, but I am. I, I, I was lucky Chris. I was salty. Brian was a wonderful, wonderful guy who was the morning man in Rhode Island. And he kind of adopted me. And I mean, you know, about radio shares, what they get in Boston, like Toucher and Rich will get like an 18 and they'll dominate mm-hmm. or something like that. Salty used to get forties, uh, owned the marketplace. I mean, owned it. And he let me, he kind of told Rhode Island, Hey, this guy's a good guy. You can, you should like him. Um, that opened up a whole world of things. And, and for me, it got me URI basketball for one year. And mm-hmm. then I met Dave Gavitt and then the Big East started and boom, things took off. 
is, is there a moment beyond the security guard that you say everything changed? Like, like, w- is there a moment that that Mike Gorman could have not been the Celtics play by play guy and could have could have been calling oh. something else? Well, I'm not so much following something else, man. I've never really, um, I don't think I've ever really applied for a job, which I think is a kind of a nice thing. Um, and I've never really had a desk, which is what I really like. <laughs> um, I never wanted to work anywhere where they took attendance. That, that's basically what it comes down to. So, um, but was there a time? Not really. I mean, once I got that job in New Bedford and once I, you know, went out and figured if I could sell this game, I can go do it. And I listen to it and I go, that was bad. But that wasn't bad what you did there. And, um, so once I started doing it, I really kind of didn't look back. Um, I never once said, okay, well, maybe if I stay here with Salty, then I can be the morning man when he retires at PRO Radio, which I probably could have, but I didn't want to be the morning man. I wanted to do sports. And so um, when Dave Gabber came along, I mean, now we're really talking. He's, I can remember sitting down in a restaurant up in Olean, New York, after Providence College had beaten St. Bonaventure. And um, Dave said to me, uh, he and I have just dinner, and he says, uh, let me find something by and tell me what you think. And he starts talking to me about getting John Thompson and Louis Conner second to fly back from Europe on the same plane with him. And he got, he said, we put, he put all three of those guys in coach, two of them in coach. So they had to talk, you know. Um, and he got them to agree that maybe it would be a good idea to form something. And Gary Williams said, sure. And Jim Beheim was okay with up in Syracuse. Uh, Louis again, Georgetown, Rolly Massimino at Villanova, PJ at Seton Hall. Um, it really, the, once that got rolling, um, you know, it, there was, there was not a night in, uh, and I say this because it's again, right spot, right time, but there was not, if you were Boston's area and you were a basketball fan, there was not a single night of the week that the best game I was doing, mm-hmm. I was doing, I was doing the Celtics and all their home games. And I was doing big Monday with Bill Raftery. I was doing two cent regional games. I was doing Thursday night regional games, Saturday afternoon regional games. And every game was like, Syracuse at Georgetown. Georgetown at Syracuse, 28,000 people show up. Um, just it's snowing like a bandit outside. I mean, it was just really good stuff, stuff to make movies out of. So, um, yeah, I wasn't about to look anywhere else. And um, until such time, I saw things starting to slide badly at the Big East. Football came in and kind of ruined the Big East, which is a whole other story, but just came in. And, and once Syracuse bolted and then Boston College left, and um, it just wasn't going to work otherwise with, without those teams and those marketplaces. But um, I, I I never thought that it would last forever. And then the Celtics wanted somebody to come in and do it all the time after I'd done, what, two or three years, maybe four years or so of just doing the away games, at home games rather. And then uh, Tommy went out in the away games with anybody who would take them out. <laughs> <Kill him. laughs> um, but anyway, uh, so no, that long-winded answer to your question. Uh, once I got started, once I got down the, started going down the Celtics Big East roll, uh, road, um, there was no looking back. I didn't want to look back. I met my wife at a um, basketball game. Mm-hmm. Daughter met her husband at a basketball game. I mean, bas- basketball went very, very good to me. You know? did, did I hear that your first date was at a basketball game? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Carry it on. Yeah. Took her up to uh, Syracuse. It was the first overnight date, but put it that way. We actually had to go somewhere and may, may not get back. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, she, <laughs> she remembers sitting there and she's just, she had just come back for a year in Europe doing graduate work in Exxon Provence, you know, sitting in cafes and all this happy stuff. And now all of a sudden the dome knitter is sitting in front of us, 28,000 people. And, and this guy taps her on the shoulder about 30 seconds left in, this, in Syracuse is up and he said, I know you don't want to hear this, but when the bell rings, I mean, when the buzzer sounds, we're all coming over the top of you. <laughs> <laughs> they did. And, you know, um, and he's like, this is bedlam. And I said, hey. Tomorrow night, guess where we're going? Another day. <laughs> I, I, I used to laugh at Brad Stevens because he said he took Tracy, his wife, to the first, uh, like a high school game in some Indian, Indiana high school. And mm-hmm. I said, I, I don't know, maybe maybe basketball is just magical for, for, for relations. So uh, Mike Gorman and Brad Stevens have proven it, proven it works. Um, yeah, so is my daughter. Very yeah. Happy. Exactly. So I need to, I need, I, need, I, I, I don't want to uh, divert too much, but so some guy just came down and tapped her on the shoulder and said like, Hey, I want to yeah. take you on a date. Hey, I've been sitting here for two years watching you instead of the game. Um, and he had season tickets. His father had season tickets, like two rows behind where we sat and maybe eight seats to our left. And um, I would see him occasionally because the ball would be going this way. And I would look and be all the heads would be going like following the ball and be one head looking back this way, you know? Um, and it was always him because Kristen was right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, 
And he said, it's funny, now he told, not now he told me, but he told me early on, he said, you know, if I ever knew that you were Christian's dad, there's no shot. No <laughs> shot. Right, down there. But, uh, did, did you hear the conversation going on? Like, does dad like alert, like pop up at this point and think, what's going on right here? Um, no, I remember asking, after, asking Christian afterwards what was, uh, what's going on, because he came down and, and talked a little bit, and then he left. Mm -hmm. uh, she was still working. I said, well, anything, are you all right? She said, oh, I'm fine. Um, she said, remember you and mom told me I should start taking some chances when I meet new people? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, he just came down and asked me if I wanted to go out to eat. And I said, sure. And he was done. He says, he said, he's a pre ready for like, well, I don't know. I don't know you or whatever. Chris goes, yeah, okay. <laughs> out to dinner they go. And they've been eating together ever since. <laughs> That's three years. They are real married. Am yeah. am amazing ba again basketball the uh the secret basketball to the, se the, the secret to love uh when did uh got it come along it's a good question i don't know specifically when i can remember talking to john johnny most who was very very good to me and probably one of the biggest fears i had when i got the job was the first time was young and i say who the hell are you and what are you doing this for instead he was like sit down sit down sit down we gotta talk you gotta get yourself a handle you get something that people identify um and so he said try him Try some different things. Let me know what you try. Um, and I, you know, I don't know whether Joe got it is totally mine because again, I I used to listen to this is before I ever thought I would be doing it as as an occupation. But late at night when I was like 10, 11, 12 years old and falling asleep, and your parents allow an AM radio in the room, and you, you know, on a good night, you suddenly find you got W, what was it W uh Detroit was Cap City Station, I forget what the call letters were, but all the big 50,000 watt stations like WBZ was, you hear it pretty clearly at night, and most of them were sports oriented that have a major league franchise of one or two. So Joe Tate, you could pick up in Cleveland all the time. You could pick up uh, Ernie Howell doing baseball out of Detroit all the time. Um, and I just listened to these guys as I was falling asleep, and um, you know, Joe used to use Got It. I've, I've heard him tape of uh, some of his old games, so maybe I stole it from him. I didn't steal it from him consciously. There are other people I did steal stuff consciously. But um, got it worked. And I went to John and John said, let me hear it. Somebody made a tape for me and John listened to it. And John said, yeah, use that, keep that. And uh, so, but I don't, I don't think it's exclusively mine, but it's, I use it a lot. I, I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes people just, uh, they put the copyright on it. And I, I feel like, I feel like that one's yours. Um, what, what didn't you. work? Did, did you, did you, was there, was there anything? Score it. Right. Score it didn't work. Count it. Count it kind of worked. Mm. Um, Bang, I didn't like because that was John's. Uh, Mike Breen uses that all the time now. I give him a hard time about stealing Johnny's stuff. <laughs> stealing Johnny's stuff, that's not good. Um, but uh, yeah, it, every, everybody borrows. I mean, anybody who tells you that everything they do is original is a liar. Uh, we, we, we all steal to one degree or another. And, it, and it's, it's, you know, it's not coming in the dark at night. It's like saying, hey, that's good, can I use that? I haven't heard anybody ever say to me like, no, you can't, you say got it because my grandfather said that, you know, I don't know. Um, so you just do it and you, you know, Sean uses it a ton. Uh, and so, um, yeah, it's just out there. Do you ever got it to non-basketball things? Are you like playing video games and like get this good, like have a good moment in there and scream, got it. Like, I, like, I don't know, like selfishly as a person who grew up listening to you, I just hope you throw it into everyday life, uh, because it would be, it would be, it would warm my heart. Only to family. Yes. You know, um, so, but my brother and sister probably don't. They say, "Who says that?" You know, they, they don't. They don't listen much. much. <laughs> but but Kristen has always, since she was little, would give me a hard time about that. Um, she would she would say to me when she was young, "Say, Dad, talk in your your basketball voice," <laughs> which I guess meant I was doing something different than I'm doing when I'm talking regularly. But um, yeah, I mean, she was great because uh, what she used to do is the babysitter or whoever would be taking care when they'd have to go off and do games. Uh, Kristen would just say, put the game on. Um, she would just fall asleep to listening to the game all the time. So um, she was not my best critic. She was my best advocate. Um, and she would tell me, that's good. That sounded good last night when you and Tommy got going. She would really listen hard. Uh, and this is coming out of like a seven or eight-year-old, something like that. So that was good. Uh, I'm jealous. Anyway, I, I appreciate your trying to hook it to me, but it's... Um, we all we all dig stuff out of the same pool. You know, you're you're, you're a good. You, you, I'm sure that it's got to be something you steal every once in a while. I mean, oh my gosh, everything. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's nothing original about me. Like I'm supposed to like avoid plagiarism and all that stuff, but no, we're all just we're all just finding. Someone finds what works, and we all just sort of yeah. jump on it. 
Uh, it's funny you say your daughter was your best advocate because uh, if, 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 if we try to put a game on a pregame show on in this yeah. household while I'm not home, that thing yeah. goes off in two seconds. My kids want to watch YouTube or, uh, oh, really? th yeah, there's got to be something better on than dad. They hear enough of, uh, of my voice when, uh, they, that they don't want to listen to. So uh, good, good <laughs> for her. Good for her wanting to, to listen. How quickly did you know that you and Tommy had amazing chemistry? Right away. Right away. We did. We did five uh, Providence College games the year before we were, ever worked together on the Celtic games. And I knew then, like, um, I, again, Tommy did not want to do any of the things that I did. And I didn't want to do any of the things that Tommy did. So we, we had no conflicts there at all in terms of who should be doing what. And um, uh, Paul Lucy is a brilliant uh, producer. Uh, Jim, Jim Edmonds has been doing basketball games with me. The very first basketball game I did, Jim Edmonds directed. Um, and uh, is directing today and still has the best handlebar mustache in the NBA. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've had really good people around me in that sense. So that allowed me to not worry about stuff and just concentrate on getting along with Tommy. And uh, that was pretty easy to do. I mean, we, we were together professionally for 40 years. Um, not many people can ever say. And I do remember having a bad fall, fight with him down in Orlando one time, once, but I've never... Other than that, there was never any time where we kind of went to bed mad at each other. I mean, we really, we just got along um, and we didn't, um, we never, you know, Tom, the last game would happen at the end of the year and I may see Tommy maybe once or twice. And once he stopped playing golf, I wouldn't see him at all over the course of the summer. And you know how it is. You, you want to say, well, I'll call every week and, but you don't. And, and all of a sudden there's somebody's calling saying it's media day. And I look at Tommy, well, Hey, how you doing? And it's one of those friendships that you really treasure because you may not see or talk to someone for an extended period of time. And when you do two minutes in the conversation, it's like you were together for the last week. Um, and that's the way it always was with me and Tommy. It was very easy to catch up. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I couldn't uh, have ever asked for a better partner or friend. Even, even the fight you said ended pretty quickly, right? He wrapped you in a beer hug right after yeah. that. Yeah, and just like, was that it? And what, did you ever talk about it again? No, that what his standard his standard line in answer to that question, which people would say, "Don't you guys ever get involved in the fight?" And he would say, "Well, you've we only had one fight, and it's not over, uh, <laughs> not over yet." Um, so he he loved that line. He would repeat that over and over again. <laughs> God bless Tom. God bless. Him. I I can't tell you. I miss him every day. I do. I mean, it may only last twenty seconds, but something happens that makes me think of him, and it's just it's it's just a great feeling. It's good. Yeah. And, and we just and we just had his birthday pass and it, it brings back yeah. the rush of emotions. And, you know, I, 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 this is a celebration. I don't want to get I, I don't want to get too down far down the, 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 the sad path, because I think we all we all just have those moments. And I, it's so true. Like I just every time a, an old game comes on, I sit there and marvel. Do you have favorite? What, what's your favorite moments? I know it's 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 impossible to, to, to say uh, and it's unfair for me to say, like, tell me your five favorite moments from your 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 40 years calling games. But like when I say your favorite moments in this job, what what immediately pops to mind? Basketball fans aren't going to like this, but it Tommy trying to say onto the Kumpo's name. <laughs> that comes to my mind right away because he knew he was way up and he didn't give a damn that he was oh. way up. Middleton and um, Antti Toku Umpo is, uh, they are 20 for 26 from the field. Giannis. 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 The great. There you go. He could make either one of those work. That last one didn't work with the other one. Antti Toku Umpo. <laughs> That was the beauty about Tommy. Um, Tommy eating fried food down in New Orleans right after Katrina, and they're trying to get everybody happy. And Tommy's sitting, if you've ever seen that tape, and he's oh, laying yeah. and eating stuff. And um, I mean, those moments with him were, were just wonderful. They were wonderful because they, they weren't scripted. They, they It happened spontaneously. Um, he usually was the one who would, who would, it would he was the protagonist, I guess. And, um, and then it was up to me to kind of, nurse it along a little further but um it, it was those moments when we of course we had, i mean bird stealing the ball on the isaiah inbounds pass i mean all sorts of you know clyde drexler hitting a fall away three in the corner i, I can remember uh, or missing one another in, in the south just went a big game over portland double overtime something like that but it was um it was it was the whole event if that makes sense that was um that are my good best moments is that i think back and 
being in the press room, looking up and down the corridor, he can see Tommy coming down the corridor, coming at about 30 degrees off, side to side. Uh, <laughs> and that's when he used to walk. He did. He had his kind of angle thing going. Um, but uh, th those are the moments I re really remember most. If I were to, um, uh, you know, it's funny. I, do you watch Ted Lasso? I have, I have not yet, but everyone has raved about it, and I need to put it on my my queue. Chris, Chris, get, if there's no other world to get Apple TV other than that, that's it. That <laughs> is so good. It is so good. And why it is so good? Because I, I, I say that because the actual playing of the game is very little. It's very little, if any. Nobody's going. On. It's all about everything afterwards and people interacting with each other and what that's all about. And um, that's what I take most from my years with Tommy was was walking in any building. Um, you know, I, I can. Um, I told you about the time coming into Philly where uh, the, you know, 80 year old guy is upstairs being held up by two people. You know, Heinz and you suck. You're <laughs> awful. And, and Tommy can't hear him. So he's looking around and showing him. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh -huh. that was stuff. That, that was the stuff that is priceless. And, and I will, um, people say, do you get sad? I, 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 I get sad because he's not here, obviously. But, but I never get sad when I start thinking about him because it's obviously on to the, the, the whatever it's called, Giannis, or he just, it was just, those moments you just saw that I couldn't make that up. That's great. If I were directly going, cut, perfect. That's great. I'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> How much longer do you want to do this? I don't know. A couple of years. Mm -hmm. We'll see. I mean, very interesting year, obviously, coming up for the Celtics. I mean, this is a, this is a radical change. I'm not sure people understand how radical this change is, not only in terms of personnel, but philosophy and everything yeah. else. Um, so um, I'd like to see if it, if it works and, and how well it works. And that usually takes at least two seconds. But, but um, you know, chronologically, I'm getting up to the point where I don't, I love to see these guys like, uh, you know, uh, who work games until their mid eighties or something like that. I think that's wonderful. Um, but I don't want to be working games from my mid eighties because that will mean Sean's pissed off and he's in his seventies. <laughs> I'm kidding, Sean. Joke. Um, um, but no, I don't want to do that. I mean, I, I want I want time to have the rest of my life, you know, which uh -huh. is uh, my wife has taken up golf and she's pretty good. She hits the ball a long way because she's an ex athlete. She would never play golf. And now I, she's, once she hit that first drive, she was hooked. I knew she was. Um, so now all of a sudden, the idea of going on vacation places and bringing the sticks is not a fight you get in before you go. It'd be something we could do together. So um, yeah, I want to, I want to, I want my life back. Mm -hmm. What? Uh, that, that's oh, a great. That's a great answer. Oh, I don't blame you. Yeah. I. I, what's I watch. A, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I will. I'll watch. I promise. <laughs> what is what is Mike Gorman like off the court? Um. It's a good question. Because uh, uh, that's a very good question. I wish Terry were here. She'd just go boom. She said, I'll take that one. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, what's Mike Gorman like off the court? I, you know, I like I like doing stuff. Um, I like uh, we. Live, I've told you before, we live in a lake, and if you, anybody knows who's out there who listens, who lives on water, you know that becomes this whole other thing in your life that you have to keep up. And water takes things down and rots things out and does all sorts of crazy stuff. And so, I mean, we we uh, our house is not an ostentatious by any stretch of the imagination, except for the Dylan guitar behind me. Um, but. Uh, you know, so outside, I don't want to say I want to work around the house. <laughs> I don't do that. But I like to get outside. I like to get in the water. I like to get dirty and do that and try to get stuff done. I love to play golf, as you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm getting to that school. Have you heard about the school of 12? No. It was really 18 holes to play 12. Okay. Yeah. Now, I can think about that. That's very doable. All of a sudden, golf doesn't become a three, three and a half hour affair. It becomes maybe two and a half. You know, if you move real fast, it could be even two plus and you're out. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I could really get into that a lot. Um, uh, are, you, are you are you card guy? Do you do you like cards? Do you walk? Cards? No, no. Mm, no uh, I walk every day. First thing, three miles every morning when we get up. Love it. And that's the, that's done. I'm drinking coffee by quarter of eight. So uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's good. Um, but um, so yeah, walking. I just read a piece about walking being maybe the best exercise of all of everything. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, I think my wife has a copy of that. She keeps putting on copy. Did you read this? I'm like, yeah, I did read that. I did. Yeah. <laughs> Five times I've read that. Um, but, uh, yeah, travel. I want to travel, but see, here's the other thing. I don't want to, 
I want to jump on planes and go all over the place, even though she does. But um, like I'd like to, I've never seen Montana. I'd like to go up to Montana and check that out and see what that part of the country is like. Um, I'd like to go out to Banff and some of these places out in uh, Western Canada that look spectacular that you could go. You could, uh, some friends of mine rented a, uh, one of those silver things that look like the trailer you put behind. You know what they call those things? What are they? Yeah, what do they call them? I don't anyway, know. It's, they're sophisticated. They're fancy trailers inside. They look like a book silver. Um, somebody will give us, bomb us with the answer on that when you point you wear this. But um, yeah, I, w- I could see pulling one of those around for a week or two, Ooh. just drive, go out and drive. Um, but unfortunately, my wife decided five years ago she wanted to form her own business and, and she's going just gangbusters. She's about 10 people to work for her now and they're all PhDs and they do all this consulting. And, and so she's um, she's really doing very, very well. So she's like, well, you can come with me. I'm going, well, <laughs> I guess. You never came with me. And then she goes, yes, I did. And she brings up the Syracuse thing again. Mm-hmm. And I have no, I have no comeback. <laughs> <laughs> Places 28,000 people try to trample you. <laughs> Uh, we can see the guitar behind you. When did you uh, yeah. when did you start dabbling in in guitars? Oh, four or five years ago. I tell you, we used to go. We play at Memphis, right across the street. It's gone now. Mm-hmm. But right, across, it was the Gibson factory, like literally across the street from the hotel. And so every time we go to the Memphis game, I would go over and look at guitars. And if you've ever been to a um, guitar centers are like this, but mm-hmm. uh, in the, the Gibson factory, they had room after room after room of maybe a hundred guitars hanging on the wall. If you want to come in and take a guitar down, sit in the stool and play for half hour, fine by them, no problem. So, um, if you like to play, even, I mean, I'm not very good, but if you like to play a little, um, and that's all I can do is play a little, but it was, I looked forward to that trip. I always want to see, oh, you're Memphis, all right, that's great. We got a day off? No, shoot, almost got joint, no, extra off here. But um, yeah, you would want to, um, I, I just like guitars. And the other thing, if, if I, I'm not going to do a house tour with you, but next time you're down and when we play golf, um, mm-hmm. I think guitars are really nice uh, wall ornaments. So I have guitars hanging. Yeah. The yeah, they look really good. I think they look great. So sure. I have a pin on the wall behind me, so I don't know. I, 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 have, I, have, I have three guitars three. sitting here in front of me. I do. I mean, me, me, this, is, this is why, like, every time, I, like, I hesitate to tell you how much alike we are. But uh, I have my video games next to me here. I have my guitars. Yeah. I, have my go- I, have all my- I have a second golf bag that my wife got me for Father's Day that I haven't loaded yet. That, there you uh, go. You know, I need to, I need to put it, into play. Hey, 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 I see the basket over there. What are you <laughs> I mean, all I got is a basket. I'm in, I'm in my basement. But yeah, I mean, like I got a little, I, this, it, 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 what's funny is I actually have a bar in front of me. We built a bar during the pandemic. And, uh, there you go. Uh, yeah, because sometimes you need a little help getting through these, uh, these times. But uh, yeah. Hey. It has acoustic, electric. What do you got? They, so I have three acoustics. I, I they're not very fancy. I think one's a, I, I believe it's a, a Takamine. I don't even know if I'm yeah. saying that right. Um, but I, I too like that when we are on the road, I will sometimes go find a guitar center. I am not great by any by any shakes. Um, but I, I always find it fascinating because I, I didn't know that was one of your one of your interests. And then okay. I didn't know vi- video games. I didn't know. Like, so as I find these things out, it's like I, I don't know if I can idolize Mike Gorman any more than I already do. Okay. But, uh, it, but I find I, ways. I'm flattered. Um, I'm flattered. You're a very talented kid. What, uh, what, we're not turning this into a Chris Forsberg podcast. This is Mike well, Gorman. Not? And what, what, what does my, what does Mike Gorman listen to on the radio? What's he listening to on the radio? Um, too much music from the old days, my wife would tell you. Too much. Um, I'm a big fan of the 70s, 80s, 90s, going up in the, uh, and then go to XM radio, and then go right back down the line. She says, once you get by, you have to keep going forward. Uh, you get bogged down in the coffee house at about 15 or, I don't mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. five, 84. Um, but uh, yeah, I like music a lot. We play music is a big part. I bought a turntable, um, Bodhi, and I have found all these people I never knew about Miles Davis, John Coltrane, all these jazz mm-hmm. people. Um, and you get them on vinyl, these old records, you can get kind of scratchy in the background, but it's like Miles Davis playing live somewhere in Chicago and uh, God knows when. So I've become a big fan of the blues through that. Um, and then Kristen and Mark, uh, this great gift you ever want to give somebody who you know, so you can join these record clubs. So I belong to one. I'll give you the address. I'm not going to give them a free plug, but I'll give you the address when we talk about it. And you give that as a gift to somebody, and then two albums show up every month. You give them okay. a year's music. Um, and what you do is, like, if you're the recipient, the first one you get is what kind of music you like, and I let the vote. 
10 categories and 30 different people mm -hmm. and you check one or two or three and they'll give you what they think marries you to that same music so that's always fun so um yeah there's always music in the house i don't um i most of the time if i'm not watching cnn um or i don't watch fox but if i, I don't if i watch cnn it goes right to silence after that. You know, most of the, it's funny, you ask me about stealing. I guess I'm too old to steal anymore because 90% uh, of the games that, that appear on the big TV behind me um, sounds off. There's no sound on. And, and play whatever music I feel like listening to at that particular moment. Uh, and, it's it's funny you say that because I have a problem when I go on these shows and they and I have to say someone's last name. I, I don't watch games with sound on very often. I'm very much yeah. like you. And then I yeah. don't know how to say them. And mm -hmm. I get very embarrassed and I'm sitting there on pronunciation guides. And uh, so I think that's normal. I'm glad to hear. Is that right? <laughs> onto the, onto the <laughs> <laughs> uh, We need to bring that clip back uh, because it, it makes me smile every time. That's makes it, see that again, makes you smile every time. You, that is what, if I were going to give one piece of advice to uh, the guys who come out of these great journalism schools up in, in, in there in Syracuse and other places is, um, you know, just do what you just said there. Don't, I get lost in my head because I run so fast into what I'm trying to say, but um, just take your time and just get through it and, and don't rush and, and then stop. Don't keep going. Too many people just say always oh, keep going, like make your point and get out and stop. And that's why good couple guys are really good. Bill Raftery, really, really good. You know, it gives a little kiss at the end, but 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 mostly his explanation of what happened on the court is, I don't know, 15 words, maybe max, um, as to a lot of guys who just talk way too much. So, um, yeah, I, I can identify with that situation. I, I, it's funny, Paul, God, God love Paul Lucy because he's so patient. Um, he'll come up and say, uh, it's Forsberg, you know, <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> what did I call him? You know, didn't call him Forsberg, that's his name. I go, okay. That happens all the time with guys on other teams. We go, did you, did you see any of those highlights I sent you this morning? And I go, uh, no. And they go, well, it's like, you know, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> he comes off the bench. He's from, I don't know where. Uh, but anyway, he, uh, it is tough if you don't have the sound on the first time you do a game. Uh, look, at, I, at, the, at the Olympics, they call them uh, Yabusele instead of Yabusele oh. throughout, throughout the whole thing. The whole thing. The whole yeah. thing. I heard a little bit of that, and I was a little disappointed in uh, Fitzy for that. <laughs> was, that it, so, can you can you really, can you beat up another announcer about that? Can you be like, hey, you got to get that one? But um, I have to believe because I know Bob, uh, and he he's um, he's good. He's a very good announcer. Mm -hmm. I call him Fitzy. I've been calling him Fitzy for like twenty years, um, but he's a very very good announcer. Um, I but I think that was probably some SID or some mm -hmm. NBC person who put out the pronunciation uh, guide that they got from the SID at the school that I used to go to or whatever. And by the time it gets down on paper, um, when you're a guy doing the games like he's doing, it, guys he's never seen before and will probably never see again, what you put in front of him, he's going to say, which is what I would do too at the same time. Uh, I, and so I also don't rule out that Yabuselli changed how the how people pronounce it, his last name. It could it could literally be, I, be, be, be any of these things. How about Mark B-L-O-U-N-D, you know? So, so, so this is Sean Grandy's favorite story. He changes every time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and 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 uh, I, I I don't know I don't know how you felt about the Mark Blount era, but uh, I've told this story many a time that he was one of the ruder Celtics of, of of my brief tenure when I was going over there. So uh, you can call him whatever you want. I might have thrown some expletives in front of uh, B L O U N T. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 that happens. Uh, what's it like to be going? into this uh, celebration weekend with Paul Pierce? That's really, a, again, right place, right time. We started off this whole interview with that, and that's that's Gorman. He pops up at the right place, the right time. Um, <laughs> yeah, Paul and Bill Russell. How about that? Same by Gorman. Um, yeah, no, that, that's really special. I haven't seen Paul in a while. Um, I'm sure I'll see him a lot this weekend. I look forward to that. He's, he's always, as you know, my favorite player, maybe of all time for the Celtics. Um, no offense, Larry. No offense, Kevin. Um, maybe, maybe the best. Um, but yeah, I, I'm sure because of that, 
the, all the Taylor guys are going to be there. Perkins will be there. A lot of guys off the championship team are going to be around because of that. So that, that'll be really fun. I, again, and I'm not trying to uh, give you any false modesty here, modesty or anything. Um, I'm concerned about um, the speech I have to give because my problem, Chris, is I get emotional when I start talking about a lot of these things. And then um, if you get real emotional at the end, you can just say goodnight and that's good. But if you get to the, in the middle, then that's a real problem. Um, because then, uh, you know, my wife says I could cry at Zillow commercials. Uh, <laughs> I think she's right there. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I don't want to be John Boehner. I, I just want to be Mike Norman. So um, hopefully we'll be able to get through that four minutes on Friday night and I'll sit back the rest of the weekend and uh, toast Paul Pierce and toast Bill Russell and uh, Chris Bosch and uh, just a lot of guys who have uh, really done nice things in the world of basketball. It, it, it's, it's really nice what they do when they came up with this and this, uh, they give one to a writer and one to an electronics guy. Um, but somebody said, how can you, one guy said, how can you win the Hall of Fame when you never played? I said, bingo, I'm with you on that. You know, I, I think nobody should be in the Hall of Fame and get players. Really? If they want to call us the, come up with the other name for everything else, no problem. That's good. Mm -hmm. But I mean, to be in the Hall of Fame in the sport of basketball, I think you should have played the game. Uh, at the very least coached it if you didn't play it um, to a high level. Uh, but uh, I don't know. You, you, I can tell by the look in your face. You were not particularly. Well, I, mean, I, 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 I just think like, uh, what there are people that give stuff to the game of basketball that is goes beyond what's on the floor. And I get your, I get what your point is, but like there's, there's wings for everything, right? Like this is the contributor wing. This is the media wing. I'm yeah. fine with that. You can break it up however you want, but I think if we're going to celebrate the game of basketball, it's perfectly fine to incorporate those that have enhanced the game for all of us. And especially yeah over the course of uh, uh, of that career. Did you know Paul Pierce was going to be that good? Did you think the Paul Pierce era, like you hear him come out this week and say, you know, he maybe wanted to be have a trade before everything, uh, before the big three came together. Did you think the, the Paul Pierce era was going to work out? Um, I did. I really did because I thought Paul, um, I thought the team was willing to do the right thing um, to try to keep him. And when it got to, again, they maybe had one foot out the door. They went and they grabbed uh, uh, the big guy there. His name I can remember. And, uh, that's a joke. I know his name. Um, <laughs> once they got done that, they knew that um, Paul was going to stick around. And there was not any animosity that existed at the time with Ray. And when he was suddenly there, uh, when Danny was able to go to Kevin and say, hey, mm -hmm. that, uh, these two guys, gonna, if you come, these two guys are right here with you. And he said, yes. I mean, they were perfect because, again, and, and you were asking me earlier about why I got along so well with Tommy. And I said, well, uh, he didn't want to do what I did, and I didn't want to do what he did. Mm -hmm. That you could say that about Garnett, Pierce, and Allen. They all had separate roles that they were very comfortable in, and they weren't trying to be the other person. And I think that made them very formidable, obviously, and tough to beat because, it, again, that they were just very happy to be themselves. And Garnett didn't care if he got eight points in the game if they won, you know. And um, and there, I've, I have never seen anybody who controlled the situation like Kevin Garnett. I mean, he just. Uh, that was his team. That was his bus. That was his hotel. That was, that was his anything. And he just ruled it. And everybody was like, okay, that's what he wants to be. And we're right alongside with him. And he was really, really good at it. I mean, right there, um, don't know, listen to the whole thing out there. Anybody don't say Mike Gorman said this. Um, <laughs> no, but I mean, you, you got to put him right there with Larry Bird in mm -hmm. terms of how he affected the outcome of games and how he affected his teammates and brought them better. Um, they, Larry did that for 10 years, 12 years while he was uh, in the 80s. And um, I didn't see anybody else do it again until Kevin showed up. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, again, I didn't care how many points he scored. I mean, how, who, Larry had scored 35, Kevin would score five. Didn't matter. They probably had an equal effect in some crazy way on the game because, uh, and that's, that alone would, would put him in the Hall of Fame in my mind. It's going to hit. I see, I, I think his numbers should be retired. Do you? Oh, for sure. Yeah, but, I mean, and, and we'll get to celebrate it this year, right? The uh, the Kevin Garnett's right. number and going to the rafters. Like, I, I don't understand, like, those that say that, you know, it wasn't long enough duration. It's not that, you know, same deal. It's, it's not about the, the the length of time. It's about the impact in that time. And, exactly. I mean, my gosh, did, no one changed the culture like like Kevin Garnett did. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, and they see the culture was desperately in need of change, obviously. Uh, whether it was 18 in a row, the year before they won the championship. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, when will the Mike Gorman book come out? 
I want that, you know, when you asked me earlier, I was going to say, I was going to say that and then said, I said, Michael, don't, what do I do when I'm not doing basketball? Um, yeah, but see, it'll, it'll come out as Ted Lasso. Uh, I mean, I, I want to do a screenplay or I want to do a, really? I want to do fiction. I don't want to write nonfiction. Hmm. Um, now, will the whole, all be about basketball will obviously play a big part of it, but that's, that's been my life and those are the characters that I know. Hmm. But, um, See, I, I want, there's a lot of people that I, I would like to tell stories about and that I know of and have watched that wouldn't be particularly flattering to you if you were them. But if I make them a character in the book, different story. Ooh. Yes, who I'm referring to, but I'll just say no. <laughs> <laughs> I like this. I like yeah. this idea. Um, Maybe it's uh, like Fisberg and Mike Bowman. You know, <laughs> See, thing is, is, you know, this Ted Lasso thing that they're showing, people try, it seems, uh, in my lifetime, maybe three or four or five years sometimes, try to come up with a sports-oriented show mm -hmm. to stick around. And they never really find one that sticks very long. Um, and this has the potential to. And I think one of the big reasons, is what I said to you earlier, is that in, in now almost two years of watching it, which I can't wait till Friday night comes around anymore to get it, to stream it and watch it. But um, I just think... You don't have to have the sports, the locker room, it's, it's mm -hmm. seen personalities of the people and how they live their lives in and through it, the game, that the game itself becomes two hours out of 24. Um, and I don't want my book's not going to be about it'll have about that same percentage of effect on what else happens if I do the book. Um, we need I don't, I, see, I mean, that's a great thing if you're like, if you're like me um, at my age and you want to just kind of stop a little bit, but you don't want to like go sit in the couch and drool um then you want to definitely find something to do and writing would be great i mean you're a writer i don't know whether you do this but writers tell me all the time that you just have to sit down and make you force yourself to write a couple of hours every day just write you know it might be a diary it might be it might be a book you're gonna write someday it might be just a collection of things you want to keep to so when you that happens you can refer back to this particular moment of time or a quote but you need to write um and so that'll be part of my day so if i walk and i write and I fish and play eight holes of golf. Get down to eight. That last one, go to bed. <laughs> Do this again tomorrow. <laughs> I, I don't know if I, because I'm the guy who gets done 18, but I, I have 17 bad holes, but then I play 18 well. And I say, hey, who wants to play 18 more? Yeah, because, you know, but if, if there's not enough hours in the day and not enough sunlight at this point. So uh, that is dangerous. I want to shift gears real briefly. You mentioned it earlier. The Celtics have made all sorts of changes this off season. How surprised were you when Brad Stevens decided to shift from head coach to president of basketball operations? I did not see that coming at all, frankly. Um, and I hope he's really successful with it. He, in fact, I got a nice note from Brad today that he's out in the Midwest somewhere and he's not going to be able to get back for this weekend. And I mean, he's just easy. He's a really good person is what he is. I mean, he's a very good coach and hopefully he'll be an excellent administrator, but despite those two things, he's just a good guy, good person, solid person. Um, but, um, so yes, to answer your question, I was kind of surprised. I, I didn't, uh, having talked with, with Wick and Steve and some other people, once it had happened, then I realized how much homework they had done and how far advanced they were. There just wasn't some, uh, you know, weekend massacre of the front office I had moved around, stuff like that. This was something they had been working months on. Danny had expressed the willingness to do less, mm -hmm. if not leave completely. And um, so that all happened very, again, if you're on the outside, that's what a book or something like this would be fascinating because if you're on the outside looking at that, you go, boy, that happened in the weekend. And you mm -hmm. go, really, it, it took about two or three months, really. And it was people talking and different combinations were being offered to different people. Um, I, I am glad Brad stayed. What do you think is reasonable expectations for this team based on the moves they've made, based on a first year head coach? Should we, because one thing I keep coming back to is this notion that, you know, like last year felt a little, I mean, the injuries, the COVID, there was a lot of unique <laughs> variables, but is, is this enough? Is, is changing the roster enough to, as, as, or is tweaking the roster as they did? enough mm -hmm. to, to, to alleviate all those issues? No, not to alleviate all of them, but I think what it'll do is instead of trying to take this problem you had last year and make it something over here, I think we just get rid of this problem over here and put something new over here and we'll see how that works starting from scratch. Um, and I like that approach a lot because again, I, I don't, I mean, I hope a lot of these kids who are with the Celtics go on and have fine careers somewhere else, but it just wasn't happening here. 
Um, and so it was time to move in a different direction, even if we could bring in somebody else who it doesn't happen for either. But um, it, it's different. It's going to be different. Um, there might be more of a commitment to a, a defensive oriented scrambling type of game as opposed to a set up the three and get the three all the time. Um, I want to see your guy come back and, and have a monster year, which would be really, he's really got the potential to do that. Um, I think the, uh, the Al Horford situation, I'm not sure about, but we'll see what happens, works out. Um, and uh, Marcus, I think he's going to probably become a little different person than he's been in the past now that he's rooted here. and Probably this is where he's going to spend his whole career. And if I'm him, I'm looking around, I'm saying, this is a good place for me to try to spend my mm -hmm. whole career. I can, I can, my number will sit up there someday and I can live here all my life if I want to. And every time I walk down the street, people will like you. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it's a good combination to put together. Again, I don't know enough about the new coach to make really any comments on anything other than what I read and you read in here. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, yeah, let's go out and let's roll the ball out there and see what happens. Yeah, I know. No, I, I, that's the way I feel. Like, I, I don't know what Ime Adoka's philosophies are or what, like, the, the brand of basketball is necessarily going to be. I know it'll be defensive-minded because based on his history. But, yeah, I'm, I'm super intrigued to see how this all works together. Were you on board with the – Marcus Smart extensions. I'm, I know you mentioned it. Rob Williams extension. Like you should have seen the party that was going on at the Forsberg household. <laughs> I bet it was. <laughs> yeah, no, I think those are two very good signings. I mean, I, you know, I've gone back and forth with even some people in the Celtics organization who uh, I'll, they obviously had their minds changed to some degree uh, as to Marcus's value long-term. But I, see, I, if you don't have a Marcus Smart, you are not going to win a championship. You need a tough guy. We didn't, we lost our toughness there for a while. And, um, uh, to give away Marcus, we, we would have become a very soft team. Take Marcus out of the line and tell me, tell me who you're looking at in a timeout and say, well, you go and stop him. Like, you know, just stop that guy for a couple of trips up and down the court. Who's going to do it? We didn't have anybody. We didn't have anybody who could go do that. We didn't have anybody who if they gave a hard foul. It's not the time you saw yourself to give a hard foul other than smart. Um, it's just not there. So to, to let him go, unless you've got some, you know, really tough guy in the return, I think you then were creating a hole that you would have to eventually fill. Or you had a lot of guys who were seeing it. And the other thing too, I mean, Garnett um, used to, I used to, all these pictures, you'd see Garnett, these pictures of him would be going like this and be pointing in somebody's face. Mm -hmm. And right here, Perkins. Perkins' head was right over the shoulder. I used to love that every time I see the shot because not that, that, that Kevin wasn't Kevin, but Perk was right there just in case somebody, somebody got, <laughs> he was going to step in. Um, so, yeah, I want to see that kind of toughness out of, out of this team. I want, I want hard fellows. I mean, come on, let's play, let's, let's play the game the way it's supposed to be played. It's not, we, you know, you can't, this game could become, because of great talents like Curry and, and some of the other people, um, you don't want to just become a shooting gallery. Mm -hmm. Everybody is out there, you, free, you know, you see you got a fast break, and all this, and there's four people spread out, and they're all getting their spots. One guy, two guys, and opposite corners and all this stuff. Uh, nobody takes the ball to the basket with meaning anymore. Um, with purpose and nobody stands in there to stop it either. So, um, you know, give me Bruno Fernando out there for a few minutes. He looks like he's willing to go get a rebound. <laughs> but let me, let me answer your question. Um, we, we've got reasonable expectations for the Celtic team. Um, home court advantage, I think mm -hmm. would be, they could get it. And that, and that would be a very, very successful season. I mean, I think Milwaukee will, will be better. I don't think they'll be worse. I think there are, um, I think Philly is going to be very good, no matter how the Simmons things eventually works out. As long as they got that big guy in the middle, he's the only guy in the league who played like an old fashioned center. And you mm -hmm. look up 34 and 18 at the end of the game or something like that. So I like, I Philly is not going to be worse. They'll be better. The Knicks are going to be better. Um, New York is going to be a really tough place to go and play again. It'll get a nasty garden, which I think is good for the sport. Mm -hmm. So the Nets aren't going to go away. I wish they would, all of them, but they, they're not going to. Uh, and so um, that's going to be tough. This is, that's what they named four or five teams. Uh, Chicago's, there's a couple of teams out there that could be real dark horses if they get their act together. Um, you didn't see Chris Dunn as he went through town. He just, he just, I, yeah, I waved. I waved really quickly as he, as you know, I know, I know you probably have a soft spot for Providence guys, but uh, I would have liked to see how it worked. Yeah, I would have, well, yeah. I mean, but that's the kind of guy I was hoping to see on the bench. A guy yeah. who's got a reputation, he's supposed to go out there and stop people. If he gets a basket or two for you, big deal, but he's supposed to go out there and stop people. All right, but look, I, I, I told you I was going to only steal a little bit of your time. And and like every time I, I ramble too much, I don't go to the Mike Gorman school of, of brevity. So uh, I, I, but I do want to leave on this. Uh, I am really excited 
for this moment. I think it's long overdue. You can't say it, I can. Uh, I told you this when the announcement came out as someone who grew up here. Uh, I don't understand why it took this long. Uh, it is nice that it is happening though. And uh, I can't wait for you to get your moment in the sunshine. I know you say that the Basketball Hall of Fame should not have writers in there, but you 100% deserve to be a part of it. You have been part of my entire basketball experience as, uh, as someone who has watched the Celtics throughout their, the duration of their career. And I am thrilled for you. Uh, I hope you, I hope you take them, take as much as you can possibly do it while thinking about that four minute speech, savor every second of this experience. I will. Thank you. Chris. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mike Gorman. All right, everybody go like, subscribe, check us out on our YouTube page. Find us on all your favorite podcasting apps. We'll catch you next time on the Celtics Talk Podcast. Bye-bye.